Hello, everyone. My name is Oren Langell, Global Justice Ecology Project co-founder and member of the Campaign to Stop Genetically Engineered Trees. And right now, I'm in Buffalo, New York, to moderate this. Welcome to the telepress conference webinar, where we will discuss who is behind the effort to legalize genetically engineered American trees and why it matters. And presenters will talk about the recently released white paper, Biotechnology for Forest Health, the test case of the genetically engineered chestnut. We are here to analyze the various reasons why researchers are developing a genetically engineered American chestnut tree and hope to win government approval to plant it throughout the wild forest, forests of the eastern United States, where the trees could spread their GE pollen and seeds freely. This would be a massive and irreversible experiment with our forests. It is completely unprecedented anywhere else in the world. Never before has a GMO plant, especially a forest tree, been developed specifically to be released into wild nature to spread at will. You can find the May 2019 GE American Chestnut Telepressor background information on the website that I believe is up on your chat box right now. One can find biographies of the panelists, press releases, the white paper, and the paper's executive summary. Uh, that website will be coming back up a couple of times, I think, in this, so you won't uh, miss it. Uh, so first, I'm going to introduce our speakers today. Uh, the first is Lois Brault Mellican, formerly of the Massachusetts Rhode Island chapter of the American Chestnut Foundation and chapter president. She and her husband, Dennis Mellican, recently announced that they were resigning from the American Chestnut Foundation as a protest against the organization's support for genetically engineered American chestnut trees. Lois will be joining us from Massachusetts. The next speaker is Dr. Rachel Smoker, co-director of Biofuel Watch and co-author of the white paper and is on the international campaign to stop genetically engineered trees. Dr. Smoker joins us from Vermont. Ann Peterman, Global Justice Ecology Project Executive Director and co-author of the white paper is a national and international coordinator for the campaign to stop genetically engineered trees. Anne is in Buffalo, New York. Brenda Jo McManama, the Indigenous Environmental Network Save Our Roots campaign coordinator, is, a, is the international, on the International Steering Committee for the campaign to stop genetically engineered trees. Brenda Jo is joining us from West Virginia. Laura Cristiano, Executive Director of the Rural Coalition, is joining us from Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C., we hope. We just heard that Laurette had to move to another location due to the Rayburn building being evacuated. And now I believe she's at the Longworth House office building. Yes, she is. I'm glad you made it. Okay, so after the short presentations, there will be time for the media to post questions to the panelists. If you're a media, please submit your questions in the chat box. Please give your name and affiliation. And right now I would like to introduce our, our first Pete speaker, Lois Brault Mellican, uh, formerly of the Massachusetts Rhode Island chapter of the American Chestnut Foundation. Lois, I'm glad you're here. Thank you, Oren. Thank you for inviting me. Um, as you know, this resignation letter was not an easy letter for us to write. After doing research and um, lo looking into the campaign to stop GE trees, it became clear to us that this project that we were doing was um, for so long and we had worked so hard for had a darker side. So. Um, this letter was sent out in uh, the end of March. Dear Massachusetts Rhode, Island, Massachusetts, Rhode Island chapter members, because of our opposition to the genetically engineered chestnut, Dennis and I have come to the sad conclusion that we can no longer serve on the Massachusetts Rhode Island chapter board of the American Chestnut Foundation. Therefore, I will also resign as chapter president. We are unwilling to lift a finger, donate a nickel, or spend one minute of our time assisting the development of genetically engineered trees or using the American chestnut to promote biotechnology in forests as any kind of a benefit to the environment. The genetically engineered chestnut is, we believe, draining the idealism and integrity from the American Chestnut Foundation. We made the decision to join TACF immediately upon learning of its existence 16 years ago. We were prepared to volunteer for the chapter until we were too elderly to be able to contribute. Looking back, if we had known on day one that Monsanto and Arbogen had an interest in and funded the GMO chestnut, we would have not gotten involved. 
Later, when we learned more about it, we were reassured by cliches about the, gem the public interest being protected by the dreaded regulatory gauntlet. Now we know better. The current administration's regulatory gauntlet is a farce. The National Academy of Science, Engineering and Medicine has said that the regulatory agencies in our country today are unable and are unable and unprepared to deal with the potential risks of putting genetically engineered American chestnuts into our forests. Our current administration has made it clear that they are on the same page as Monsanto, Arbogen, and TACF. We feel that a lot of important and valuable bat cross breeding work has been done, and this progress would be threatened if these 94% American hybrids are contaminated by GE chestnuts that would be allowed to spread their pollen with no controls or regulations as is proposed. Even though by resigning from the board, we will be drastically reducing our level of involvement with TACF, we remain strongly committed to the school projects we are involved in, as well as the effort to create beautifully designed chestnut groves at Flint Park in Munson, Mass. We also encourage and support those individuals who are now developing organic chestnut agricultural crops in Western Mass. We admire the work done by the Campaign to Stop GE Trees and agree with them in opposing the unknown long-term risks posed by the genetically engineered chestnut and other genetically engineered trees, and we intend to support them in future endeavors. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lois, for the, your uh, presentation. Uh, next on the panel will be Dr. Rachel Smoker, the co-director of Biofuel Watch, and also the co-author of the white paper. And she, Dr. Smoker, Smoker joins us from Vermont. Rachel. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. So I wanted to just provide a little bit of background about what has been engineered into these trees. Um, the SUNY ESF group has tried a lot of different things, um, including testing of six transgenes, so from unrelated species, and 26 six, cis genes, which would be from related Chinese chestnuts. And they've also experimented with various markers and promoters. But they've determined to focus on a sequence that's derived from wheat, and it is a sequence that codes for the production of uh, oxalate oxidase, which is an enzyme that inhibits the uh, spread of the of the fungus on the tree. So it doesn't actually kill the fungus, but it uh, makes it harder for it to spread enough to be lethal to the tree. Next slide, please. The question is, is this going to work? Um, it's being put forth to restore chestnuts to their natural environment. So um, the, the SUNY ESF group uh, and TACF have put you know, a lot of messaging out there, including Buster Blight and Charlie Chestnut, and um, you know, the Buster Blight um, is attacking Charlie, and Charlie puts up his shield, and, and uh, the chestnuts are protected forever after from the blight. Uh, which is very misleading. Um, the tests so far on the oxalate oxidase or oxo tree, engineered tree, have only been done on very young trees and only under controlled conditions. We know that when trees go out into the forest, they could live for a couple of hundred years and face a lot of different kinds of environmental conditions um, that could affect how that, how that trait is expressed. We also know that blight resistance is a very complex trait in the, in the uh, Asian chestnuts, which are naturally blight resistant, and that it's probably going to require multiple pathways for a long-term stable resistance to the blight. And even the SUNY ESF scientist, Mr. Powell, says this very explicitly. He says, eventually, we hope to fortify the American chestnut with many different genes that confer resistance in distinct ways. Then, even if the fungus evolves new weapons against one of the engineered defenses, the trees will not be helpless. And, you know, that's because we know that engineering fungal resistance is a very tricky business because, uh, and it's been tried in many, you know, common crops. But the problem is that pathogens like fungi are good at finding their way around plant defenses. And also when they, uh, when they invest their uh, resources into defending against pathogens, it affects their growth patterns, they don't grow as vigorously, and they can be more susceptible to other pathogens. And so this is why really commercially available, there's only one um, uh, fungal pathogen resistant crop that's available, and that's a, a potato. So, and the other issue is that even if resistance to the blight is reasonably effective, there is another pathogen, Phytophthora, or also called root rot or ink disease, which is also lethal to American chestnut and had already been 
chestnuts before the uh, light came and, doff and Phytophthora is spreading. Next slide, please. So it seems very unlikely that simply encoding this wheat gene to oxalate oxidase is going to enable the restoration of American chestnut into our forests. So the question is, why is this being rushed into the regulatory review? Because it's a test case and it's being very explicitly referred to as a test case, a test of both the regulatory pr uh, processes for genetically engineered forest trees and also a test for winning over public opinion, which has generally been very opposed to the introduction of uh, genetically engineered trees. So there are, you know, in our white paper, many, many quotes and from different sources referring to how this would be a test case. And just as one example, the Forest Health Initiative, which is a major funder of the effort, says this initiative will focus on a test species, an icon of the Eastern US forest, the American chestnut. The American Chestnut Foundation also says, if it's successful in obtaining regulatory approval for the transgenic blight resistant American chestnut trees, that would pave the way for broader use of transgenic trees in the, in the landscape. Next slide, please. So what are the other uh, trees that are being um, researched in the world of forest tree biotechnology? That's the broader context that we need to look at. And that is mostly focused on commercial applications, especially poplar, eucalyptus, and pine speci species. And it's mostly about commercial uh, uses, producing more biomass, withstanding the stresses of plantation forestry practices, altering wood characteristics, and especially modifying the characteristics of lignin so that wood can be more suitable to the production of uh, biofuels. And researchers such as Steve Strauss, who uh, has been very prominent, is very, they're very explicit about this. We use modern plant biotechnology uh, to help create environmentally sustainable biotechnologies to aid in the production of crops, renewable energy, wood, paper, ornamentals, and fruit. So it's not focused on forest health for the public good. Next slide, please. What are the risks of introducing GE American chestnut or any other GE tree? It's contamination of other trees of the same species, ecological impacts to the water, to the soil, to species. Also in the case of chestnuts, human health, because people do eat uh, chestnuts and inhale the pollen. And the question is, can we really assess the risks given the complexity of forest ecosystems and given how little we know about them and how little we really know about the American chestnuts role in those ecosystems? Next slide, please. So the even broader context is that biotechnology is really um, um, expanded recently with a lot of the development of a lot of new uh, technologies, gene drives, gene editing, um, um, you know, um, de-extinction, designer babies, engineered forests. The question is, where do we draw the line? Decisions that we make now will be precedent setting for the future of biotechnology regulation in general and for the application of biotechnology to forests and to conservation. Thank you for having me. Uh, I wanted to first thank uh, Dr. Rachel Smoker for a great presentation. So now the next speaker is going to be Ann Peterman, the Executive Director of Global Justice Ecology Project. And she and Rachel are co authors of the report and the white, of the report white paper. Uh, Anne is also the National International Coordinator for the Campaign to Stop Genetically Engineered Trees, and she's coming from Buffalo, New York. I'm, I'm going to be talking about some of the, uh, the interest behind the GE American Chestnut. <clears throat> Excuse me. Researchers and backers of the GE American Chestnut like to portray themselves as working in the public interest, but a look at their own reports and tax documents, and I've looked at these extensively, reveals years of corporate backing for the research, which begs the question, who ultimately benefits if the GE chestnut is deregulated? Besides biotech companies that benefit from its PR value as an iconic tree, there are timber, paper, and biomass companies that want to open the door to large-scale plantations of industrial GE trees like eucalyptus, poplar, and pine. These industrial GE trees have faced overwhelming opposition by entities like the UN, forest certification schemes, NGOs, scientists, and the public. So industry needed an iconic tree as the emblem for their renewed campaign to win over the public and open the door to industrial GE trees. And then they picked the American chestnut. The SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry's American Chestnut Research and Restoration Project 
is leading the effort to genetically engineer the American chestnut tree. While they paint themselves as uninfluenced by corporate interests, they receive funding from companies and institutions with vested interests in advancing public acceptance of GE trees and biotechnology. This includes Monsanto, Duke Energy, Arborgen, Timber Multinationals, and others. And these groups together provided SUNY ESF with 40% of their GE chestnut research funding between 2008 and 2017, which are the annual reports that are available online. The general public during the same period provided 3%. Uh, even Bill Powell, the researcher leading the researcher leading the work on the American chestnut, discusses the tree's useful role during a planting at the New York Botanical Garden. The New York Botanical Garden test planting of a GE American chestnut is being established to meet several objectives, including incredible public education opportunities for SUNY ESF's American Chestnut Research and Restoration Project, the American Chestnut Foundation, and transgenic plants in general. In addition to Arborgen, uh, next slide. In addition to Arborgen providing half a million dollars to SUNY ESF, Arborgen's chief technology officer, Maud Hinchy, worked closely with the project to offer technical support. As a result, one of the SUNY ESF lines of GE chestnuts is called the Hinchy One. Next slide. Monsanto has also provided in-kind and monetary donations, including helping SUNY ESF prepare for the federal review process to deregulate the GE chestnut. Both Arborgen and Monsanto will benefit if the GE American chestnut is deregulated. Next slide. The American Chestnut Foundation gave SUNY ESF grants of $500,000 between 2015 and 2017, dwarfing their contributions to any of their other chapters or research. In addition, the New York chapter of TACF provided $650,000 to Powell's research between 2018, excuse me, 2008 and 2015. The source of those funds is not disclosed. According to their annual reports, however, TACF has dozens of corporate funders, sponsors, and partners, including Arborgen, Monsanto, Midwest Vaco, Duke Energy, DuPont, and many, many others. Another major promoter of the GE chestnut is the Forest Health Initiative, which was founded by Duke Energy, the U.S. Endowment for Forestry and Communities, and the U.S. Forest Service. It is a collaborative effort to advance the role of biotechnology to address forest health challenges. The initiative will initially focus on a test species and an icon of Eastern US forests, the American chestnut. According to the American Chestnut Foundation Science Committee, the Forest Health Initiative proposes to use the American chestnut as a quote, poster child for genetic modification. Next slide. The initiative is staffed and managed by the Institute of Forest Biosciences, whose partners include SUNY ESF and Arborgen, as well as International Paper and Midwest Vaco, Futurigene, Weyerhaeuser, and Fibria, all of whom are pursuing GE trees in the US and or Brazil. The Forest Health Initiative provided more than 30% of the funding for ESF's GE chestnut research between 2008 and 2017, 10 times what they received over this period from the general public. The corporate backing for research into GE trees, next slide please, is a major reason for the overwhelming and passionate opposition by the public in the US and globally, starting in 1999, when a field trial of GE trees outside London was cut down. Next slide. Since 1999, countless actions have targeted industry conferences, government agencies, and GE tree research, including field trials and greenhouses in the US, Belgium, Canada, Brazil, and New Zealand. Hundreds of thousands have called for a ban on GE trees and the UN Convention on Biological Diversity as well as the Forest Stewardship Council and other forest certification schemes have called for the precautionary approach with regard to GE trees. In response, the GE chestnut and biotechnology companies generally, <clears throat> excuse me, the GE chestnut and biotechnology generally are being promoted as the salvation to the problems faced by our forests as a way to undermine this vast public opposition. But the public has been clear, they will not stand by while GE trees are rushed to the market for the benefit of corporations, imparting yet more risks to our already beleaguered forests. Thank you. Thank you, Anne, really appreciate that. And just a little note that I uh, yesterday saw a message from uh, William Powell wanting to know uh, basically the, the, the breakup of where the money was coming from, from where 
uh, what he was getting from corporate sponsors or from the communities or from you know citizens, et cetera, et cetera. So Mr. Powell, I hope that Ann's presentation uh, helped you on that. So it was pretty thorough. Uh, I'd like to call Brenda Jo McManama. She's the Indigenous Environmental Networks Save Our Roots Campaign Coordinator and is the International Steering Committee for the Campaign to Stop Genetically Engineered Trees. Brenda Jo is joining us from West Virginia. Thanks a lot for being here, Brenda Jo. Thank you, Warren, and thank you to everyone who's joined us today. Indigenous peoples have lived in harmony and thrived within forest ecosystems for thousands of years until the invasion of peoples, plants, animals, and microorganisms from foreign lands. Our ancestors thrived by learning, adhering, and passing down to successive generations. Their knowledge of natural law in every geographical area has its own complexities, seen and unseen. What works in one area won't necessarily be the right choice for, or action for another. Next slide, please. Researchers and supporters of the GE American Chestnut complain that restoration is taking too long. Indigenous peoples know that natural law has its own timetable and isn't measured in minutes or years, but di driven by symbiotic relationships within an ecosystem and responds accordingly. I call this rush to insert this tree into our natural forest the fast food mentality of biotechnology. And we've learned how he unhealthy fast food is for us. Next slide. Science has barely scratched the surface of knowledge needed to safely force a non-native version of the American chestnut into forest ecosystems. Not enough time has been dedicated to studying a multitude of factors. We know that employing biotechnology to manage or eradicate disease is unpredictable at best. And we've heard how quickly a fungus can employ natural defenses and render any attempt to inoculate the tree from this threat ineffective at best. Isolation of pollen and threat contamination is probable. And when something goes wrong, containment and reversing damage is not possible and will violate indigenous self-determination and sovereignty. Indigenous people for centuries have lied to and forced to accept decisions made without consent. And this has to stop. Next uh, slide, please. Researchers and supporters of the American chestnut haven't been completely honest when it comes to the probable outcome for their GE version. There is far too much industry influence in the research and the regulatory process. Significant amounts of money have been given to this research from corporations and government agencies, and they've sought professional strategy guidance to influence public opinion. If this is, if this is such a good idea, why would this be needed? All of this leads to little to no confidence that what we are being told can't be trusted. Next slide, please. There are many more GE trees waiting in the wings. They're being designed expressly for commercial use for current and new markets that will only increase the need for more trees and additional forest resources and will cause the destruction of the natural forests remaining. Industry is looking at forests as a cash crop and for nostalgia, to soften public opinion. Actually, they're banking on it, and the Trojan horse is to usher in a new era of GE trees for corporate profit and control. Next slide, please. Our medicine people teach that our relationship with the plant nations is predicated on respect and communication and rightly question whether that relationship will be compromised. Even the slightest changes to the genetic makeup of any organism creates a non-native, invasive, and unknown intruder. Next slide, please. All too often, we have thrown caution to the wind, and how many examples of our mistakes do we need? Capitalism in all its glory has caused forests to disappear forever, eradicated countless species, and continues to create need where there is none. The American chestnut could have been saved, but humans thought they knew better, and today, once again, we're paying the price. Next slide. We have great respect and work closely with many dedicated scientists, researchers, community members, and many of them are tribal peoples. However, their conclusions and perspectives in some cases are in direct conflict with counterparts who are funded by multinational corporations and federal government agencies that are working for them instead of us, the people who will suffer these mistakes. Indigenous people's opposition is based on the evidence of past and current decisions that have provided the lessons learned that we should factor into all future decisions. Ultimately, we expect that our choices, based on our understanding of natural law 
and the tenets of indigenous traditional knowledge, whatever those decisions may be, will be respected and honored. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Brenda Jo. I really enjoyed your presentation mm -hmm. and just quickly saying that the world is in such a turmoil right now and uh, hopefully people will start listening to what indigenous, indigenous people have been saying for millennia. I'd like to introduce the um, next presenter who is Loret Picciano. Mm -hmm. He is executive director from Rural Coalition who is outside the Longworth House office building in Washington, D.C. Um, Loret, please. Uh, um, Okay, thank you all. Um, I'm going to be talking about perspectives from our rural and ag communities about what could go wrong. Is our uh, genetically engineered cultivar is going to help us or hurt us? So let's start in Oklahoma. Um, the next slide. Um, we're going to talk about the example of eastern red cedar. Um, our rural coalition member group, the Oklahoma Black Historical Research Project, uh, is working with farmers who um, are being invaded by eastern red cedar. Now, eastern red cedar is a natural um, tree, but what's happened is it's growing outside its range and creating devastating consequences. Um, it consumes about 55,000 um, um, gallons of water. Uh, here's a gentleman trying to have grazing on a 40-acre operation, and just to remove just three eastern red cedar trees is taking that entire bulldozer. Um, and they also need support from groups like the United States Department of Agriculture and Natural Resources and Conservation Service because it's taking, eastern red cedar is taking over 800 acres a day in the state of Oklahoma. Um, especially affecting black farmers because if they're living on their grandparents' land and they don't have a title to their land, um, they're not eligible for USDA programs to help them clear eastern red cedar. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, eastern red cedar is not only in Oklahoma. This is from the Natural Resources and Conservation Service website in Kansas. Um, it started, it, it, it spread aggressively when, we're not, when rangeland is not um, properly managed. And so during the Dust Bowl, and remember when the Dust Bowl came about, you know, in the 1860s, you had um, the great transition that happened at the Homestead Act and the taking over of the land of indigenous people and the indigenous management system. And then we moved towards monoculture cropping so that we had a Dust Bowl by the 1930s. And so in the 1930s, the Prairie State Forest Project of the United States Forest Service encouraged the farmers to plant um, cedar as wet as wind blast, as as wind breaks. And so what happened is now instead of having frequent um, smaller fires, we have major fires. Let's go to the next one. Um, but before European settlement, the eastern red cedar was only growing in certain places, um, in canyons and other places where um, and along riverbanks where fire didn't reach. And then they did use um, fire as a way to manage eastern red cedar, and that improved diversity and habitat. Eastern red cedar is shallow rooted, and so after the fires, the other um, deep rooted plants could come back and maintain the integrity of the entire ecosystem. But now, because we built houses and because we haven't been burning it, it's a dangerous fire hazard. Let's go to the next one. Um, so what's been happening is we're having massive, massive wildfires. Um, there were, uh, and as noted here, the fires are getting bigger and bigger. And also it seems like the whole climate is changing. Um, there, there's a pattern of warm Februarys and, and, wet sum, and, wet, and wet winters, I mean wet summers, excuse me. Um, but what also is happening is in 1996, if you compare a, 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 that with a fire that occurred in 2016, there are thousands more eastern red cedar trees. So this is just one invasive species escaping its natural habitat. What does this portend for genetically engineered cultivars that we know nothing about? Let's do the next slide. Um, we work all over the country. And 
in the southeast in particular, there is a real push by all the entities that Anne went over to plant genetically engineered forests as for paper and other types of fiber crops. And right after Hurricane Michael, which came farther inland than any tree, ha many trees were knocked down um, in the panhandle of Florida and into Georgia. And what we're afraid of is it becomes a time to do replanting um, with invasive species of all trees and what would happen if we use genetically engineered trees. We work with rural and tribal communities around the country and we're finding many, many problems that the communities are concerned about. The decline in forest quality in the Central Valley of California um, and um, the communities in the southeast, of course, in Oklahoma, the forests in New Mexico. And there's a lot more risks and dangers, not only of fires, but of uh, dangers um, in, um, through disasters. And so that's what we're worried about in the regulatory process. What um, could happen uh, if we, you know, how, what kind of regulatory process can we design to even learn anything about it? And then the final slide is a picture of a traditional, of, of a forest in, um, in East Branch in New York State, which is the Delaware watershed, and it, it also crosses over to the watershed um, and the reservoirs that also um, feed provide water to New York City. And what will happen, this is within the natural, natural habitat of where the um, um, GE chestnuts, um, where, where chimney chestnuts, American chestnut have been growing. And what happens if something happens to those, uh, to those forests? How are we going to um, provide water to the populations of Philadelphia and Trenton on the Delaware River? Um, and how are we going to provide water in New York City? We just don't know enough, and we need to protect um, all the natural forests that are still out there that we had. So thank you very much. I'm sorry for the interruption there. Thank you, Lorette. This is Oren. I wanted to thank all the presenters for excellent, uh, excellent comments. I believe that this was a very, very good, con you know, good conversation, and we had a chance to actually present our cases against the uh, genetically engineering of um, American chestnuts and what a potential folly that that is. And this is where we are right now today. We're in a pretty bad place ecologically. United Nations Science issued a scathing 1,800-page report on the dire state of the environment. At the same time, corporations and researchers are promoting the unregulated release of new unproven GE trees into forests. Our new white paper highlights the risk of this plan. These transgenic, transgenic trees are, quote, totally outside the limits of biologic exper experience to quote Rachel Carson, who learned over five decades ago that the devastating impacts of the hundreds of new unproven and ult ultimately dangerous chemicals entering the environment every year. We must not proceed in arrogance or ignorance and not repeat the same mistake and make the same ecolo and make the ecological crisis worse by releasing GE trees into the forest. Genetically engineered trees are no more than a false solution and also geared to make money. And I believe that we need to really look into what this all is about and Rachel Carson didn't actually say things about the, the, uh, the transgenic trees because it was five decades ago, but she was talking about the, uh, the, the things are going totally outside the limits of biologic experience. And she did that in Silent Spring, a very, um, a very strong book that helped start the uh, environment, kickstart the environmental movement, modern environmental movement. So thank you, and I'm uh, ready to take questions right now. Uh, yes, we, we have a question. Uh, what is the next uh, step in the uh, regulatory process? Can you, uh, is there a journalist with an affiliation who's asking that question? I did not have the affiliation, but uh, it is a question. Um, well, 
I can answer that or Rachel, if you'd like to. Basically, you know, we're not clear what the exact timing of the deregulation process is. Um, at the American Chestnut Foundation meeting last annual meeting last year in October in Alabama, it was indicated that the researchers then at that point thought it would be imminent, you know, within the month or before the end of the year. It hasn't happened yet, so we are not entirely clear what the holdup is. But um, yeah, so it could happen anytime we're um, just waiting for the publication of the petition. We do know that the researchers are working with the USDA and the EPA to determine the best path forward. Thank you, Ann. Steve? Well, we do not have any, okay. Uh, here's a question from Sam Evans. Um, I believe he is with uh, New Hampshire Public Radio. The question is, the white paper discusses concerns of indigenous communities with these GE trees. Can you give a specific example of an indigenous community that has expressed concern about the oxy chestnut or the OXO chestnut? Yeah, I can answer that question. Yes, uh, at a uh, food sovereignty conference up in New England, and in Narragansett territory, I had a couple dis couple discussions about this tree uh, and GE trees in general. Uh, one one man who was a forester from up in Aquasasne was um, not necessarily of that certain gene. He was just very concerned that we were that anyone would consider um, genetically engineering trees to begin with. Uh, one because of their their life cycle, their lifespan, uh, uh, and the short period of time that this uh, research and development is being taken place. Um, he also works with uh, uh, ash trees and, you know, he was, he was asking about any genetic engineering, you know, to um, fight that pest, the um, emerald ash borer. At the time I didn't have any, I think we looked up something, but anyway, he was just really concerned with it and knew about the uh, American Chestnut Society uh, doing their work and had a lot of good things to say about it. So just generally, we are very concerned with genetic engineering across the board. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Um, if there's any other questions, please provide them via chat. And I wanted to point out, this is Oren Lango, that the uh, all the proceedings have been recorded and um, we can make them available to whoever needs them. Uh, but please ask questions. It's uh, quite amazing to have all this talented people uh, in the same uh, phone conversation, albeit in different places. I have a question from Megan. No affiliation given. Have referendums been submitted for the public to vote on this issue? I mean, I go ahead, Rachel. Well, I, I think the quick answer is no. Um, it has not been. It's it's going to go into the uh, into the government agency regulatory review process, but not uh, necessarily for um, public referendum. But that's not a bad idea. Yeah, and this is Lorette. And one of the things that's also happening in all the government regulatory processes is they're going out. And they're speeding up right now with shorter and shorter comment periods. So it's going to be really important for the public to remain vigilant. Thank you, Lorette. Anybody else? Queuing well, up? thank you, Megan. Uh, is there are there any other questions? Uh, please uh, submit your questions uh, via the chat box. If you're not familiar where that is, that should be at the bottom of your screen. Yeah, this is this is BJ. I would suggest people on this call if they want to uh, if they want to comment when this when the EIS comes out to uh, please uh, follow or, or sign up for the newsletters at stopgetrees.org or saveourroots.org. We will be putting that information out or I think Biofuel Watch website. We've got those in the um, information sheet that Oren talked about. Uh, 
question from Megan, are there online petitions? Hi, Megan, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, yes, there is an online petition. You can find it on the stopgetrees.org site. We uh, just launched it. So um, we're just, we haven't really put it out there yet, but it has been launched. And it is on the stopgetrees.org site on the menu. You will see something called petition. You click on that and it will take you to a page that has the petition. And, and this is Orrin. I just wanted to interject something about some of the other petitions that we've been responsible for from the UN to uh, getting it out to the public and some of the latest responses we had. I believe we had, I don't know, over a quarter of a million people against genetically engineered trees. Maybe you can explain that, you know, separately, but it is an issue that the public does not approve of genetically engineered trees. And I think this is one of the reasons that the iconic chestnut has been chosen. So how, how many people, Anne, if we, over the years, have we had signed petitions and had them delivered all the way to the UN to actually to Arborgen itself and other places? Yeah, and this is Lorette. We are also, we've been um, watching, like the U.S. Endowment for Forestry and Community has been doing a lot of work outreaching to the African American farmers in the Southeast. I know Arbor Dan is working with South Carolina Department of Agriculture, we think on, um, you know, frost tolerant eucalyptus. And what we're afraid of is they're trying to do things with the African American community, you know, with the farmers to um, have them resolve some of their heirs property issues but what we're afraid of is then they will come in and try and get them to be part of growing and planting um, these other varieties for you know and they're actually looking now at using um, the forestry products for exporting wood pellets and other things and without a real understanding of what the implications are for communities and that's why we feel it's so dangerous because you know any tree that's introduced we don't know um, what what it will do and the farmers that would be planting it have no way of knowing yeah there's also the precautionary principle in any of this so we have a question regarding um regulatory agencies and comment periods can anyone uh speak to upcoming comment periods a little more this is Rachel. I would like to just comment um, on Megan's uh, comments about engaging the public versus regulatory agency public comment periods. It's really important for us to engage with the regulatory agencies on their public comments, but um, having done a lot of them, they can also feel like hamster wheeling uh, because the regulatory agencies, you know, don't necessarily take our comments all that seriously. They've um, you know, we don't have a lot of confidence in that. And especially under a Trump administration, the general trend has been for the regulatory agencies to basically permit anything that goes through. And um, so it is really, really key to engage the public because something can get through the regulatory process, but if the public doesn't want it, then that's where we are able to be more effective. Um, because people just simply won't, for example, want to plant these trees um, if they've been, if they understand, uh, if they understand the issue, even if it, if they do get through the regulatory pr process. And that's one the of the USDA and sorry, go ahead. This is Lorette. Um, the USDA Animal Plant Health Inspection Service will be where will um, probably have some of the regulatory role and. Um, the comment periods, as I said, are becoming shorter and shorter. You used to maybe, you know, have 120 days, it might be 60 days or even shorter. And I think the other thing besides signing petitions that's also important is to be in touch with elected rep representatives, both at the national, um, state and even local levels to start making them aware, uh, because Congress has oversight responsibilities, um, and it would probably take action at that level as well as massive public action um, to stop any bad decisions that may be in the wings. Right, and the raising public, public awareness 
about the risks involved with this genetically engineered American chestnut tree is why we developed the white paper. Um, we wanted to be clear that our concerns are science-based. They're not because we believe in a flat earth or some of the things that researchers say about us, um, which is, you know, kind of petty. But um, so, you know, we wanted to make sure that people were clear that we are completely science-based. We know what we're talking about. This is all documented. The white paper, ha you know, has pages of references. I encourage you to all to check it out. Look at the references. Look at the annual reports of the researchers of these organizations like the American Chestnut Foundation, the Forest Health Initiative, um, the Consortium on Plant Biotechnology Research, uh, et cetera, et cetera and look at what is really being done about the American chestnut, the genetically engineered American chestnut, and why, it's, why it is getting, is the focus of so much, so many research dollars when there are so many problems plaguing our forests. And this is just barely touching one problem in the forest, um, you know, a tree that virtually disappeared 100 years ago when the forests are experiencing um, crises a crisis upon crisis from climate change to invasive species to other pests and pathogens being brought in by global trade uh, and so forth and so on. There's, you know, we're in this because we love the forest, because we care about the forest and we want to make sure, and the communities that depend on the forest, and we want to make sure not another human caused problem is exposed into the forests. You know, so yeah, that's why we're here. That's why we put out the white paper and we encourage people to share it, to read it, and look at it even more closely. Thank you, Anne. Are there any more questions from the press? Because if not, I would like to give the panelists about one minute to state any kind of a final point. And if, they're, if they want to, that's fine. If they don't, I guess we could go around the horn from the beginning. And uh, uh, Lois, would you like to add anything in a minute? You don't have to. Um, the back cross, I wonder what the rush is, you know, the back cross breeding program seems to be working fine. Uh, we're engaging school children and, and, you know, different partnerships. To me, I'd rather bring back the chestnut one community at a time than to have to, real, to, have to rely on um, biotechnology companies. Thank you. Thank you, Lois. Uh, uh, Dr. Smoker. Smoker. Yeah, I would just reiterate that this is really a precedent setting uh, case because it is the first forest tree species that would be and the first species that would be released specifically to spread out into the forest freely. Um, and it, once that happens, it's going to be very difficult to call it back or reverse this big experiment. Um, and it is in the context of a broad push to use biotechnology in a lot of ways with new technologies that have been developed that uh, including gene editing and CRISPR and all the rest that we've been hearing about in the news. Um, and, and there's a lot of debate in the regulatory circles about how we're going to regulate all of this. So I think um, rushing this GE American chestnut through the regulatory process and out into commercial availability would be um, hugely problematic. Thank you, Dr. Smoker and Peterman. Yeah, I would agree with that and just point out, as, uh, as Lois said earlier, the regulatory agencies involved in making decisions about whether or not to legalize the um, unregulated release of this genetically engineered chestnut tree have no precedence. They have nothing to go from. They are completely unprepared to deal with this. And uh, they're going to go ahead and make a decision based on you know, what they pull out of their hat, I suppose. So uh, yeah, this is another major concern that we have about making sure that the public is fully engaged with this, that they understand the risks, that they understand that this isn't just putting a tree that's been missing from the forest back into the forest, that this is a genetically engineered tree. This is a being that has never existed in that forest before. And we have no idea what the long-term impacts of that will be no idea at all and there's no one even looking at that um there are very short-term studies and that's it thank you ann uh, um brenda joe from ian yeah i just say that science has you know we're at a crossroads and science has a unique opportunity 
to teach us more about how things work together and, and how we can change what's happening and work with nature instead of against nature. There's some really uh, interesting research that's taken place and some evidence that the citrus greening disease that our orchards, our, our citrus orchards are suffering is not from a disease, it's from years, decades of using chemicals, glyphosate, herbicides, pesticides. There's, um, I'll try to find it and send it to the people who, you know, contact me, whatever. But this guy has, has actually uh, restored some uh, citrus orchards and brought them back from like the brink. So science has an opportunity. We work with science scientists. Rachel is one. We've got other scientists that are working with us. Like Ian said, we're not flat earthers. We know that what we do right now has, a, an, I don't know, we're just right, we're right on the precipice here and we got to use some common sense and we have to look to people who know how to work with nature instead of against nature. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda Joe. That was great. And before I go to Lorette, uh, do we have a contact number we could throw up on the screen? That number, but necessarily an email address, maybe, of, of how would be the best way for a press or anyone to get a hold of us. I don't know if that would be Steve, but uh, anyway, I will say that uh, we should have somebody up there. And the last uh, person to give a response will be Lorette. Thank you, Lorette. Yeah, I just wanted to say, that that's why we're looking at the experience of eastern red cedar which is not even a genetically engineered tree for the incredible devastation because it was purported to be a solution to the dust bowl <clears throat> now it's the major ecological threat ranging from missouri all the way over to colorado <clears throat> and down to new mexico i mean down to um, oklahoma and texas and we didn't know what we didn't know then so what will happen with GE trees? I'm oh, sorry. <clears throat> thank you so much. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Lorette. Are you done? Yeah, no, well, <clears throat> sorry, I just lost my voice, but yes, thanks. Okay. <laughs> off, anyway, hopefully it's not fall out from the Rayburn building. Amazing. <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah, you did a good job in the in the uh in the wind. <laughs> Thank you for doing that and finding a place to do this. Uh, if there's no more questions, going once, twice, no more. Uh, on behalf of Global Justice Ecology Project, the Rural Coalition, Biofuel Watch, Indigenous Environmental Network, uh, Global Justice Ecology Project, and I hope I'm not missing anybody, but the campaign to stop genetically engineered trees. I thank you all for your presentation. I also thank all of you from the media that listened to this conference and hopefully uh, we can continue the dialogue because we want to open up a space, uh, uh, we want to open up a space for real dialogue on this, not just industry public relations. So thank you all for coming and we'll see you again sometime in the future.